we introduce packet filtering firewalls. So very simple, they, they look at the packets which pass through the firewall, they look at, in particular at the headers, and if you're browsing through your lecture notes, you won't find this here, this was in the, the extra notes just for this week. But you'll follow. A packet filtering firewall, as packets go, come to it, it looks at IP address of the source and destination, who sent it, who are they sending it to, port numbers, which identify applications, so which client application is sending to which server application, protocol number, uh, which identifies the transport protocol being used, TCP, UDP and others, and use that information to determine sh shall we allow this packet or not, accept or drop. There may be other information used as well. We'll see, uh, we could potentially use other information about which interface it arrives on, other packet information. So it's looking at the packet headers to determine which one to accept. And the packet filtering firewall is made up of a set of rules that the administrator of the network creates. So the rules are really conditions based upon this packet information where we can have wildcards or, or ranges. And when a packet arrives, the firewall map compares the packet information against the rule. If it matches, it takes some action. So that's what we got to on Tuesday. Let's go through some examples to demonstrate those concepts. Here's our simple network. So let's go through a different example where we have a firewall in the middle, say running on a router that connects an internal network and an external network. The internal network has many computers. One of them is computer one with IP address 1111 and the other is computer two but the outside network there are also many computers there. I just draw one. Computer 2. So, here's your task. Set up a firewall such that, for the first case, let's say our firewall has a default policy to accept everything. We have set up that so that we'll accept all packets through. Let's write down the default policy. By default, that is if no rules match, we will accept the packets. So it's a rather open firewall. So we want to accept everything, but we want to block some things. So for an example, let's say you want to block, block computer 2 from accessing the web server on computer 1. Create the rule. Rule or rules. So try. Computer 2 needs to... We should block computer 2 from accessing the web server on computer 1. Anyone? What are you going to do? This is going to be your task uh, in the quiz, in the online quiz. And some of you will have the task in labs as well. Block computer 2 from accessing web server on computer 1. How? What are you going to do? Firewall, yes, but what's the rule for the firewall? Filter the IP and protocol. What IP? So, here, let's, let's create the rule here. So I've drawn the, think of the firewall table contains a set of rules, a set of rows, where we look at the source, the destination, the transport protocol being used, and if our packet matches our rule, we'll take some action. So we need to specify the rule. To block computer 2 from accessing computer 1, what's the source IP address? Computer 2 from accessing computer 1. This network is an internal network. This is outside. 
Computer 1 is our web server. We want to allow everyone to access except Computer 2. We don't like them or we think they're malicious. So we want to set up the firewall so that they cannot access the web server. Source IP would be that of Computer 2. So we'll write the rule should say that if the source IP is 2.2.2.2 in fact I've just listed the column source here remember there are two things that identify the source the source IP identifies the source computer and the source port number identifies the source application so we'll try and list both of them under this source column and the way that I'll do that is we'll write the IP address followed by a colon followed by the port number. We'll come back to the port number. Destination address. We want to stop 2 from accessing the web server on 1. So the source address match must match that of computer 2. The destination must match that of computer 1. What protocol? TCP is the transport protocol because we said to stop access to the web server. What protocol do we use for the web browsing? HTTP. But we're looking at the transport protocol, not the application protocol, HTTP, but the transport protocol that it uses. And HTTP uses TCP. So the protocol must be TCP. But we're missing some things. The source port number we want to write here and the destination port number. The easy one first. Destination port should be 80. Again, stop computer 2 from accessing web server on computer 1. Destination port will be that of the web server, which is 80. Source port. What port number does the web browser on computer 2 use? Anyone have a computer? Open your browser and find the port number that it uses. Open your browser, connect to a website, and type in netstat on your terminal. Easy. Now open your terminal, and you don't need. Open a terminal and type in netstat, and you'll probably see the list of N E T S T A T network statistics, but what? And you'll see, to make it easier for you to see, netstat minus t. And he sees a list of values. And scroll up. Look at the local address. Your address, 10.10.102.81. Dot Read out those five digit numbers. Five one. Five one. Five one. I'll read them to everyone. Five eight four four four. Five eight four four one. These are the port numbers of his web browser. Five eight four three eight. Five eight four two four. Any structure? No. The, the browser doesn't use a fixed port number. Okay, The web server uses port 80. We know that. But a browser, the operating system, when you start the browser and it tries to connect, the operating system will assign a port number from some range. Okay, it's not random, but it, it's assigned dynamically. So when com user on computer 2 opens their browser, it will get a port number and try and connect to our web server with port at destination port 80. But we need to configure the firewall rule before they connect. So we won't know the port number used by computer 2 in advance. 
There's no way to know that because today it uses 50481, tomorrow it uses a different number. So the source port number, what will, what will we use here? Any value. Star. Okay. So in the firewall rule, when we configure it, we say if it comes from computer 2, from any port, and going to computer 1 specifically to port 80 and using t TCP, then we'll take some action. So we don't specify a specific port number. We say any value, or I'll write as uh, star. I mean, anything matches, we, which is just a range, all possible port numbers. If the packet matches those conditions, what do we do with that packet? We take the action of dropping it. Easy. User on computer 2 opens their web browser. It gets some port number. 50481. They send a packet to the destination port 80 on computer 1. It will get to the firewall. The firewall will look at the packet information, compare it against this pre-configured rule, and see that it matches. And therefore, the firewall will drop that packet, not allowing it to go to computer 1. Computer 2 wants to connect to the, the web server. The web browser starts. Let's say it gets port number similar to his laptop. That's assigned by the operating system to the browser. Sends a packet. Goes across the network. Gets to the firewall. The source port is 50481. The source IP is 2222. He's sending to 1111 destination port 80 using TCP as the protocol. Therefore, the packet information will match this rule and the firewall will drop that packet. Delete it. It doesn't send it through to the destination. Achieving our aim that computer 2 cannot access the web server. Any questions on that? The, the simplest of firewall rules that you'll see. Okay, let's create a new one then. Let's try a different scenario. Let's go back to our start. Let's try it where we have a different default policy and have a different aim. In that first example, we said the default policy was accept. That meant if a packet did not match the rules, we would allow it through. We would accept. Let's try the opposite. Default policy is drop which is more secure, it's recommended. Meaning, let's set up this firewall to drop everything. No one can communicate via the firewall unless we add a rule to allow them. Let's try a different aim. We want to drop everything, that is block everything in the network, but Let's say we want to allow the person on computer 1 to access the web server on computer 2. So block everything in the network, no internet access at all, except computer 1 can access the web server on computer 2. Try to set up the rule. 
Computer 1, access the server on computer 2. So look at if computer 1 tries to access the server on computer 2, think about the packet. What would the source IP be? What would the destination be? Protocol, we're still using web browsing, HTTP, which is used as the protocol, the transport protocol, TCP, so that's easy. So just write the rule to stop, no, to, uh, sorry, what did I say? To allow computer one to access the server on computer two. We want to stop everything except computer one accessing the server. What do we do? What are you going to do? You go get a job next year, okay? Or maybe in summer training in the next month or so, you go work at uh, a company and they ask you to set up their firewall. If you don't set it up correct and someone attacks their network, they fire you. What are you going to do to set up this firewall? <laughs> quit the job. Nice life you're going to have. Just quit the job. Give up. Think of the source. Who's the source? We want to allow computer one to access computer two web server. Source is? Okay, so 1111, one, 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 one. okay, good. We, this is what we want to allow to happen. We want 1 to be able to communicate the, with the web server on 2. Okay, so web browsing, very simple. So yes, source IP. Source port number. Port number of your web browser. Well, how about a different challenge? This is you in, in the lab or in SIT and you have control over the firewall. SIT set it up to block all your internet access. But now you want to access your favourite website. So what do you do to allow yourself on computer one to have access? What port number is your web browser using? What port number is your web browser using? What, what's this? A sign language? What sign? Star. Okay. Star meaning your port, port number of your browser may be any value. The firewall or the administrator of the firewall doesn't know what it will be in advance. So let's set it to be any value. Destination. Two. This is easy. Destination port? 80. 80. Protocol? Action? Accept. Okay? If a packet arrives at the firewall and it's from computer one, any port number, any application, and it's going to computer 2, specifically to the web server on computer 2, using TCP, then let's let it through. Let's accept that packet, meaning it can go through the firewall to destination 2. Default, if a packet doesn't match that, drop. Easy. What's the problem? we need to allow the response to go back. We need a second rule for the response to come back. Okay, so it's a, not as easy as the first case because this allows my request to go to computer two, but of course web browsing is not much fun if you don't receive a response. Computer two sends back some response. Source computer two, does it match the first rule? No, the response. So the first rule doesn't match, there are no other rules, therefore the action to take for the packet is to drop that packet. 
So although we allow the request to go out, we don't allow the response to come back. So we need to add a new rule to allow that. In fact, it's not the HTTP request and response, it's the TCP SYN. Uh, I have a picture just to remind everyone somewhere. It's just a reminder, a quick reminder of how web browsing works. Say computer one wants to connect to server on computer two, they want to send a request. We don't immediately send the request, we first set up a TCP connection. So we, computer one sends a TCP SYN segment to computer two, computer two responds with a SYN ACK, and then computer one responds with the final ACK. This is this three-way handshake. Set up the TCP connection. Once that connection is established, then they can transfer data. And the data is computer one is sending a HTTP request saying, I want this web page. And hopefully computer two sending back a reply saying, here is the web page. So that's it. There may be some further acts that come as well. But remember, we actually set up a connection first. So to allow our web browsing, we actually allowed that first SYN packet out, but we need a new rule to allow the response to come back. Okay, so we'll add that second rule now to allow the response. What's the second rule? What do we do? Allow the response. The response is coming from computer two. Port number, it's coming from the web server. If I send a request to a web server, the response is going to come from that web server, come from port 80. Destination, should be coming to computer one. Destination port, don't know, star. Remember this is to cover the response to the client, from the server to the client, and we don't know the, the client's, the browser's port number. Still using TCP, and we need to accept that. Okay, so we need to be careful that we need to allow the request or the, the packet out. And of course, all most applications are request response based, so we need to allow the response back. Anything that comes from the web server on computer two going to computer one will be accepted. Anything going from computer one to the web server on computer two will be accepted. Everything else will be dropped will be blocked. And that should allow all of those packets through the firewall. The first SYN packet coming from computer one to the web server on computer two. The SYN ACK coming from the web server on two going to computer one, that will be accepted. And so were the ACK and the request and the final HTTP response because they all have those same addresses. Anything hard so far? No? So a small extension to allow the response. What's the problem? You've just failed because someone, you, you configure your firewall and the company fires you because someone hacks into your network. What have you done? You've opened up a hole somewhere. How? It's not, not an easy one to, to take advantage of, but it's possible. If someone sends to two or one... So these are the rules. Everything will be dropped except packets that meet, the, meet these conditions. So what's, what have we done wrong, or what can we allow? There can be a 
response without a request. Or there can be a packet. There can be a packet from who? Okay. Let's say now the user on computer two is some malicious user. They want to get a packet through your firewall. How do they do it? Well, if they send a packet, if their application uses port number 80, this second rule will allow the pa packet through. So, if, so let's say the user on computer 2 is malicious, they want to get a packet through the firewall, the firewall should only allow web browsing from 1 to 2. It shouldn't allow computer 2 to send arbitrary packets to computer 1. But it can. Because what the user on computer 2 does is they create their application that uses port 80. And they send a packet to computer 1 and that will be accepted by the second rule. So if the user on computer 2 can create an application that uses port 80, they can get their packet through the firewall, defeating our original intentions. Okay, so it, it assumes that the user can use port 80. Uh, can, can you use port 80 on your computer? Those with computers open, do you know how to use port 80? Is that a static port? Well, how about this? You can do anything you like on your computer. Okay, if you've got control of the computer, you can program it to send with an address whatever you like. Remember, this is a packet that is created at computer 2 and sent out. The source address, the source IP will be 2.2.2.2. .2 the source port, whatever computer 2 wants it to be. Okay, because it's under control of the computer 2. So yes, we can send a packet with source port 80. Either create an application that uses that port or use a fake port address. It's not hard to, to f use fake addresses. So we opened a hole where some unintended consequences of computer to it is now allowed to send packets into the network, even if it doesn't get a re request from the web browser. How do you close that hole? So you can keep your job. How are you going to close the hole before your boss finds out about it? Delete the rule, but then you've blocked web, web access, and your boss will certainly notice then. Okay, We needed this second rule to allow the web server to send a response back. Computer 1 is the boss's computer. You need to set it up so he can access the website. If you delete the second rule, he'll never get a response and he'll fire you in five minutes. But you've got a bit more time now because he doesn't know there's a hole in the, the, the firewall. So how are you going to fix it? Any ideas? Sorry? Use authentication. Use authentication. Well, no. Uh, let's say all we have available is looking at the packets. Okay? That's all we have available. What if this step, the destination uh, port, will, will we use two nodes? Set the destination port. Uh, In the second row. Okay, but what are you going to set it to? Set the destination port here. What value? Uh, but th remember, this is the configuration of this firewall, some device on the network. The port number is chosen by this computer. So when the boss starts his browser, it gets a port number. He starts it tomorrow, he gets a different port number. Which one are you going to set it to here? Well, it's going to take many possible values. That's why we use star, any value. But maybe you're on the right track. There are different ways. Set the port again. Force his browser to use the same port. I don't think it will work very well because usually a browser, when you open multiple tabs, it may use multiple ports. Okay. Yep. Okay. We need some other condition that says only accept this packet if it is a response to a previous packet. 
Okay? That was the intention of this second rule, to say if we se send a packet out, this is to accept the response coming back. It shouldn't, ec it shouldn't match if it's the original packet, if it's the first packet. So that's the idea, and we'll go straight to that, is that if we can keep track of what's happened in the past, then we can effectively add more conditions to this to say, okay, if we, if we sent a request out, then we should allow the response to come back. That makes sense, because I think most applications need that. So keep track of what's happened so that we don't have to uh, we don't allow any packet to match this condition. Actually two ways. One is if you look at the TCP connection setup we could use those values. The first packet is a TCP SYN segment the packet coming back is a SYNAC. So that second rule should only match that SYNAC or packets that, if we can identify, are responses to previous ones. So somehow we need to identify a response and attach that condition to rule 2. So it gets a bit harder than we originally thought of allowing web browsing. Let's go to the easy way to do it. We add a new feature to the firewall. we add what's called stateful packet inspection. And it will simplify our task and make your job much easier when you set up the firewall. So far, our, our firewall is what we call stateless in that it doesn't keep track of what happens to the packets in the past. But that doesn't work so well, especially when we have connections. So we'll introduce this new piece of information to keep track of past packets, especially past packets that have been accepted. So let's use our example to explain how SPI, Stateful Packet Inspection, works. The idea is that if we allow this first packet out from computer 1 to the web server on computer 2, then we should allow all of these other packets through the firewall. We should automatically allow them. And that's what stateful packet inspection allows us to do. It keeps track. If we accept the first one according to the firewall rule, then all of the others which are related to that one, let's accept them as well. Let's see how it works. Let's attach just our first rule and return to that one, which was if the source is... So this is the same first rule as we had before. The source is 1111, any port going to 2, computer 2, port 80, protocol TCP, accept. And our default policy, same as before, is drop. Now, before we add this second rule, but we saw it allowed packets in, it gave us a hole. So let's not add this second rule and use just the first one. But now let's introduce another piece of information or another table of information called our stateful packet inspection table, SPI table, where we'll keep track of packets allowed. We'll keep track in some SPI table, similar source, original source, original destination, protocol, 
and we'll add another column state. So this is a second table that we store in the firewall. We have our rules, but we have this other information stored. And let's see how we use it. Computer 1 tries to establish the connection. And I'm going to flick through, but Computer 1 in this case establishes the connection. Again, IP is 1.1 and the IP of Computer 2 in this example Computer 2 is a web server running port 80. What port number is our client running? Well, when we start our client, it gets assigned one. Let's give it one. Just a random port number in some range. So the first thing we do then when the computer 1 tries to contact the web server is it sends this TCP SYN segment. where the source address is 1111 and port 40163 this is just a random one I've chosen the destination IP is 2222 destination port 80 protocol TCP that's the packet information this SYN segment goes from computer 1 and gets to the firewall Is it accepted or not? So go back to our firewall. Does that packet get accepted? Yes or no? The first packet in our web browsing from computer 1 to server on computer 2, is it accepted? The first packet, yes, because it's from computer 1 to computer 2 port number, I think, oh, what did I choose? 40631 going to a server this rule mat matches the packet and therefore we accept that packet so that's normal the normal behaviour of, of our firewall compare our packets <laughs> against our rules we accept it, we allow it to go through to computer 2 but also because we accepted it we add an entry to this SPI table we keep track of the packets we've accepted. So let's add an entry that keeps track of that information. And let's just remind us. So, sorry. A packet from computer one with source port 40163 was allowed to go through to computer two with destination port 80. That's the SYN packet, the first one. So let's record those addresses. And let's write them down here. From 1, 1, 1, 1, 4, oh, what was it? 163, destination 2.2.2.2. Two, dot two, dot two, dot two port 80. Protocol was still using TCP. So that was the packet accepted. It has these values in the addresses. And we record this information along with what, what this packet is related to. And that's what this state is. This is related to setting up the connection. I will not write it here because we'll run out of space and I'll change it quite shortly but the state at this stage is we're trying to set up the connection this one packet was to set up a TCP connection so we record this in this table now the second packet comes back that was for the SYN 
it was accepted through the firewall, firewall that got to computer 2. Computer 2, the web server, sends back this CNAC. Source IP is computer 2. Source port is 80. Destination computer 1, destination port 40163. Still using TCP. It gets to the firewall. It gets to the firewall and now what the firewall does is before it looks in the, the firewall table it actually compares to the values in the SPI table. We've recorded these values in the table. The packet that came back was from 2222 port 80 and it was destined to 1111 port 40163 and because the values match in the SP stateful packet inspection table, the firewall automatically accepts it. Okay. Now, note that they don't match the source destination, it's the opposite. Because it's the response, those values uh, are the opposite. That is, the source was 2222 port 80, destination was computer 1. But it still is considered a match with respect to stateful packet inspection. Because the, the response packet belongs to the connection identified by these values. So that packet is automatically accepted. So the idea is that once we allow a connection using our firewall, all subsequent packets related to that, that connection are also allowed. So our responses are allowed, the, the CNAC, the ACK and so on are allowed without having specific rules in the firewall. What does the state do? The state is used to indicate well, what part of the TCP connection setup are we in. So the first one we were setting it up, eventually it would become established. And it would store some values saying the connection is established. TCP connections go through different states. But the, the one that once we've set up the connection and we can send data is called established. So once we have this value or entry in the SPI table, any packet that matches these conditions is accepted automatically. We don't check the rules. If it doesn't match these conditions, we go back to checking the rules. If it doesn't match any of them, we go to the default policy of dropping. Okay. This greatly simplifies our firewall rules. We just need our original one rule. We don't need to deal with the response. SPI automatically does that for us. So actually we now have two tables of information. The rules and the connections. Questions on stateful packet inspection. So you can impress your boss when you go get that job. So think of it as an extension of the basic firewall. The basic firewall, we just have the rules. But with stateful packet inspection, we can simplify the rules by keeping track of the connections that we've already allowed. Note that a connection in the internet is uniquely identified by these five values. When your browser talks to a web server, then there should be in the internet no other browser using the same source IP and the same port number talking to the same web server. Those addresses identify that unique connection in the internet. Therefore, if we ever see a packet that matches these, either the source matches this and the destination this, or the opposite way, if it's coming from 2 and going to 1, then we can accept it, because we accepted it from here. So in practice, stateful packet inspection is commonly used. One way to think of it is now we have two tables. A packet arrives at the firewall. 
First, check in the SPI table. Does it match? If so, accept. If not, let's go to our rules in the firewall and take the action if it matches. If it doesn't match, take our default action. Drop. So you can think there's sort of three steps. SPI table first, the rules, otherwise the default action. Any questions? All easy? Quiet means easy, correct? Let's go back to our lecture notes then and see what we've missed. So we said, just going back, that we've got packet filtering firewalls, this basic concept of look at the packet header information. We can extend that with stateful packet inspection. There are some other type of firewalls called proxies. Well, we're not going to introduce them. Okay? We're going to keep it simple and stay with the basic ones. But th they're still important, uh, but we'll just stick with packet filtering firewalls so that you can be experts on that. we saw that the most common information that's used to filter packets is IP address, port number, protocol number. But you can use other information. You can use what interface did it come in on the firewall. You can use MAC addresses. You can use TCP flags. Is it a SYN segment? Is it a SYN app? So you can use other information, but these are the, f the five common ones which are important. Rules are processed in order in our firewall, so always think of them as a packet comes in, compare against the first rule. If it matches, take the action and you're done. If it doesn't match, move to the second rule and keep going and there's usually some, either some rule down the bottom that in captures everything or just a default rule, default action to take. Where do you find firewalls? In software? Most operating systems have inbuilt firewall software. We will use IP tables, so you'll get some experience with IP tables in Linux for firewall setup. Uh, you can install your own software, so you can download some software to install a firewall on your computer. Uh, but that's more so, well, that's for, say, firewalls on the end computer. But in large networks, usually the firewalls are installed on network devices with the aim of protecting the entire network rather than having to have a firewall on every computer. So most routers, most large routers when you buy them may include some firewall capabilities. Or you can buy dedicated hardware that acts as a firewall if you need to have a fast processing speed. Packet filtering firewalls are quite simple. We just set up the rules. Uh, transparent to users, meaning the firewall doesn't modify anything. It either blocks or accepts. In the simplest terms, it doesn't change anything. So the user, right, if it's blocked, the users will know. But if it's accepted, the users won't know. The other types of firewalls that we go through using proxies may change the data as it passes through the firewall. So it's not transparent. It may modify the data. They're very fast because uh, they, the functionality is not much different from a typical network device like a switch or a router. So they can do things, uh, process packets very quickly and they, they don't delay packets much. Some attacks, some malicious software for example, firewalls cannot prevent. A simple packet filtering firewalls cannot prevent. So if they're just looking at the header fields, they don't look at the data. If this packet contains a virus or spam, our simple packet filtering firewalls won't detect that. They're just looking at who sent it, who it's going to. Uh, a few other things. How do we use our packet filtering firewall to allow one user to access a website but allow other, stop other users from accessing the same website. How can we do that? 
allow me to access a website but stop all the students from accessing the website from SIT? How could we set that up? The port, uh, that is, in SIT, from my office computer, I need to be able to access some website, Facebook, but no students in SIT can access Facebook. What would we do at the SIT firewall? Okay, we need some way to identify the user, but packet filtering firewalls generally don't consider that. Okay, yes, you're right, we could do that. What's a simpler way? Maybe not as bad, good, but IP address. Configure the firewall. If it knows my office computer's IP address, say everything from Steve's computer with this IP address, let it go. From all other IP addresses, block it. Okay, so. In simple firewalls, we can use IP addresses, but more advanced features of today I'm using one IP address, but in my laptop I have a different IP address. So how do I allow that? That's when we need some more advanced way to identify the user. Simple packet filtering firewalls don't do that normally. We need more advanced features. As with any firewall, if you set it up wrong, you could have a compromise in the security of your network. If you add the wrong rules, you make a typo when adding those rules, then maybe something uh, is allowed in that shouldn't be. And stateful packet inspection keep track of the connections, except everything relating to those connections that have already been accepted. The problem with packet stateful packet inspection is that we need to keep track of many connections sometimes. Let's, to close on those two, let's show an example. It's hard to see. Uh, here's one computer and we'll look at the firewall. I have to zoom out a bit. Uh, we'll not explain all of it, but you'll see these are rules in a firewall. So if you look at a particular line, you see this firewall says accept packets which are using TCP coming from this source address, and this is a special value meaning any source, all zeros, coming from anywhere, so think of a star, going to computer 192.168.122.10, so that's the destination IP address, and destination port, DPT, the destination port is 80. So this is saying, this firewall is set up to say, anyone who contacts the web server on this computer 10, the packet will be accepted. Okay, and there are some other rules to allow access to secure shell servers, 22. Email servers, 25. Secure web browsing, HTTPS, port 443. Okay, so just an example of some rules. In this software or this firewall, stateful packet inspection is enabled using this special rule to say, record the established connections. So remember there are two tables, the list of rules and another SPI table that keeps track of all the connections. That's stored separately. It's hard to see because it's quite large. but we'll try. It, the software keeps track of connections called NF contract, connection tracker. Again, it wraps across lines, but let's just highlight some values. This is, so every line is one connection that it's tracking, this firewall at this point in time. And we see some values that this connection is established, that's the state. The source is computer 192.168.122.11. Destination 150 address. Source port 80, destination port 53968. So this is the SPI table. Any packet that comes into the firewall that matches those values, where the source and destination can be in either order, will be automatically accepted. That's the idea here. And there are many different uh, 
values if we scroll through. Okay, so just an example that we keep track of many connections over a period of time. The, the way, the state of those connections may change. The idea is that if there's no packet sent along those connections for some period of time, delete it from this table. So time out value. So we have two tables. The firewall rules that you, the administrator, creates. Someone has to set this up. And the SPI table, or the, the, the list of connections, that is automatically created by the firewall. You don't have to manage that. Yep. Ad blockers work in a similar way? Ad blockers, ad blockers are software that, what do they do? They, they do filtering, yes. Uh, so yeah, um, they use similar concepts. Filtering based on, they look at addresses and domains, I think. Uh, but they also look at content more than a packet filtering firewall. The, in this firewall, we don't really look at content, whether the, uh, the web page contains this text or not. Ad blockers will look at content. Any other questions on firewalls? That's, we're going to stop there on firewalls. Uh, or we will not go through the proxies. There is only a few slides on the proxies. Uh, firewall locations, where do you put them? Well, in practice, in large organizations, you, you don't put them on the end user computers, or they may be on the end user computers, but the firewalls are usually located on network devices, routers and switches, or special network devices, so that they cover all traffic for the network. And we don't need to set up a firewall on every computer in the organization. We can do it on one central location. It's common to separate the internal network into zones, two zones. The internal network for all the, the workers or the, the computers, and the internal network that has servers which should be accessed from outside, like web servers, email servers. So we can think inside SIT, there's an SIT web server which is inside our network, but people from outside should be able to access it. But then there's my computer which is inside the network, people from outside should not be able to access it. So we separate them out. And the concept or the terminology you may hear is that we put the, those public facing servers, the ones that people from outside need to access, in a demilitarized zone, a DMZ some part of the network which is separated from the rest of the internal network. For example, is our internal network, office computers and so on, no one from outside needs to be able to access them. So here's outside, the router is this red one, out here is the rest of the internet. No one outside should be, should be able to access our intranet, our internal network. But in this DMZ, is our web server for SIT, our email server. And again, they are part of our internal network, but they need to be able to be accessed from people outside. So we actually separate them into two zones, this zone which is uh, separate from internal and external, the DMZ. And this green box is the firewall. It should be set up to say, if someone sends in to one of our servers, send it into that zone. If someone sends in to one of our something that's not a server, block it. So it's easy to set that up. And if you want to be extra secure, you can use two firewalls. If someone sends in, the first firewall directs it into the DMZ. Nothing will go from the first firewall to the second firewall to the, the internal network, unless it's a response to what came out. And having two firewalls adds extra security because if there's a, an attack on one of them and it's compromised or it's misconfigured, someone sets it up wrong, then we have the second one as a backup. 
So if there's an attack on the, the first firewall and that an attacker can get their packets through it, then the second one, if it's configured correctly, will block those packets to the internal LAN. Similarly, if there's a misconfiguration in the second one, the first one should block and not allow anything through. Let's stop on firewalls. Just a quick